For our closing sessions, I'd like to call on the California Chamber of Commerce and CEO Jennifer Barrera to kick off a conversation with California's chief executive, who continues to bring his responsibilities, a lot of energy, and a lack and a knack for tapping into the innovative and resilient spirit of California. His commitment to the long-term well-being of the state is clear and much appreciated by all of us. Please welcome for this morning's chat, Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you. <laughs> you had to bring up the recall. <laughs> Unbelievable. Good morning, everybody. By the way, one lost on me when nurses were introduced and vets, we all plotted. You introduced the legislature and the governor, and no one <laughs> even feigned to be impressed or proud. It's a hell of a world we live in. Welcome, Governor Newsom. Yeah, Good morning. morning. <laughs> Good morning. All right. <laughs> Well, Governor, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. It truly is a privilege to be able to have this discussion with you this morning and uh, to have some of your time. Uh, we have, of course, business leaders and uh, distinguished guests from all over the state here with us this morning uh, and listening intently on your comments with regards to how the state is doing, the impact, of course, for our business community. So I'm just going to start off with a very general question to get our conversation started. Uh, because we're here with uh, business leaders across the state, we of course hear in the media a narrative about the direction uh, where California is going or where it isn't going. Um, and of course, our businesses are the ones who are creating those jobs, creating those uh, opportunities here. So what does it mean uh, when we say we're the fifth largest economy in the world? What does it mean uh, as far as that with regards to a national perspective, an international perspective, and if you can share with us your thoughts on where California is going and your perspective on where we're, where we're at. Well, that, what does it mean? I, I like that question and, and that frame. It means we have no peers. Um, it means a that so we still punch above our weight. Uh, we're a state, yes, it's the seventh largest economy in the world at $3.86 trillion. Japan, about $4.2. Germany, $4.4. It's extraordinary when you consider that. Seven years in a row we've held that status just uh, reinforced last week. Uh, we're a state that's the size of 21 state populations combined. I think that's important to remind. I remind myself of that all the time. As it relates to policy making, one size doesn't fit all. It's not top down, it's bottom up, it's regions. We talk often about regions rising together in terms of an economic and workforce development paradigm and thinking. Uh, but it's a point of pride. Um, when I say we have no peers, it's not just on economic output. More scientists, more engineers, more Nobel laureates, more patents emanating from the state than in a state in the nation. We dominate the largest manufacturing state in the United States of America, double Texas and Florida combined. We have more egg jobs, more hunting jobs than any other state in America. Design and attainment. You look across the spectrum of bioscience, biotherapeutics, bio innovation, quantum computing, we dominate. We talk often about AI, 35 of the top 50 market cap AI companies. And the works are all here, just in one state, the state of California. We dominate the finest system, higher education anywhere on the planet, conveying more talent than anywhere else on the planet. And more venture capital. This is a wealth creation machine, the likes of which has never existed in the United States of America and continues to be to this day. More millionaires being printed today than ever in the state of California. More people earning over $50 million a year, up 158% in the latest finance numbers. People earning over $50 million a year. More startups than any other state in America. 7.4% year-over-year startup growth. More uniform companies. Those are the billion-dollar private companies, 57%. 57% are in the state of California. So when I hear the, the doom loop from some of those networks, um, you know, it, it, it sort of begs a reality check. And, and so it's a point of pride for me to say all that. Uh, and it's a point of privilege as governor, but also a point of pride as, a, as an entrepreneur. Remember, I, I didn't start, I wasn't born 
in a suit and tie. <laughs> I started out as a small business owner with pen to paper, 13 investors, 7,500 bucks each. Opened a little business down at Greenwich and Fillmore in San Francisco. Grew that to 23 little businesses, restaurants, hotels, a few wineries, with about seven employees. And I said, I'm not impressed, but impress upon you how proud I am of this entrepreneurial energy, this innovative spirit that defines the best of California. And close again, the resiliency. And I think what it means to me as I close that loop is that we maintain a remarkable capacity for renewal. And that, I think, is a big part of our story as well. Thank you for that. I love to start off a conversation and talking about uh, what, what is positive about California, because oftentimes, of course, in the media, it is portrayed as the negative, and as the Cal Chamber, we love uh, to highlight our strength, uh, our innovation, uh, our entrepreneurial spirit here in California. So thank you so much for those opening remarks. All the positive that we have does not mean that we don't have some challenges. <laughs> homelessness and housing, is that where we're going? Let's go. Let's start off with that. <laughs> so homelessness, of course, is something uh, that I hear about all the time from our business members. They are dealing with it, of course, yeah. on the front lines. Um, it's attacking their communities in which they're operating. Um, and it's just a, a continued challenge uh, seeing individuals suffering, of course, on the streets. Your administration has been absolutely in front of this. Uh, and, of course, with the passage of Prop 1 in March, um, a key part of this, we were happy to support it. Many people here in the room were happy to support it again as another tool to address this crisis. Can you, can you give us kind of an over, overall strategy of how Prop 1 fits into that? And also, um, when, when can we really expect to see noticeable change with some of these tools, um, including Prop 1? Well, uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate you acknowledging the work we've been doing. Uh, as a former mayor, former mayor of a, a, a city that also feels under siege in terms of press and position in San Francisco, when I was mayor, I never thought about calling the state of California for help to address the issue of homelessness. Never even occurred to me. I worked under two governors. It wasn't the responsibility of the state. In fact, the state shared no responsibility, didn't even utter a word about homelessness. And Governor Davis, to his credit, had a task force or wanted to have a convening. That was it. There was no investment. There was no strategy, no plan. When I got here just five years ago, no strategy, no plan, no focus at the state level to address the issue of homelessness. I'll remind you, in 2005, 20 years ago, we actually had the peak count for homelessness, higher than even today, 188,000 in our point of time count. In 2005, again, the state was not in the driver's seat of race to that issue. It was clear to me and obvious to all of you that the cities and counties can't do this alone anymore. And I often say I'm no longer the governor of California, I feel like I'm the mayor of California. And that's hard because it's 476 cities, different counties, different funding sources. Some that are focused real accountability, and resolve others that, frankly, just pass the buck and point fingers. And so it's been a struggle. But more importantly, it's been also a point of pride working with legislative leaders, you see Tony Atkins here and others, that have enthusiastically embraced unprecedented investments, not just financial investments, but investments in reform and accountability. And working with you, the Chamber, the last few years, we have made tremendous progress addressing the needs and desires of cities and counties. They wanted new tools, and I'll talk about part one in a second. They wanted reforms, conservatorships. We got it done. They wanted new pathways, new paradigms as it relates to not just substituted care as it relates to conservatorships, but supportive care under a paradigm we call care court. They wanted more investment in the behavioral health space broadly defined. They wanted reforms in our Medicaid system, Medi-Cal, something we uh, referred to as our Calain proposal. They wanted more flexibility as it relates to zoning and land use. Unprecedented sequel reforms in the state, a new homeless strategy that includes $15.3 billion. When I got here, $500 million was appropriated right when Jared Brown was leaving. $15.3 billion. Now, all of you are saying, well, $15.3 billion, what a waste. Because you went to the right question. When am I going to see it? When am I going to feel it? 
I can regale you and talk about 68,000 human beings. This has been politicized that we've gone off the streets just through state run initiatives, particularly Project Home Team. But you don't see it, you don't feel it. And I don't either. And that's why I've been very aggressive with the cities and counties saying, I'm not interested as governor in the next three uh, sessions to keep investing in the status quo. We need to see change. We need to focus on the encampments. We've got to get these tents off the streets. We need you to be as focused as we are in addressing this issue, the quality of life, the degradation of our neighborhoods, particularly coming out of COVID, whether it's a tough city as it relates to what's happening on the streets and sidewalks. Some are doing it, some are not. And then we've got to address the courts. They're saying you can't do it even if you want to. That's why I did an amicus brief in front of this conservative Supreme Court asking for more flexibility to address the issue. But one of the things that was missing was the original sin in California, and it was a bipartisan endeavor. Don't lazily fall into this as a partisan point. And that was the institutionalization. In California, 1959, it's an interesting fact, in 1959, we had 37,000 psychiatric beds, locked beds in California, 37,000. This is not a knock, but it's an interesting fact on this individual. Bipartisan endeavor to begin the process of closing those. By the time Ronald Reagan left his second term as governor, we were down to 7,000 beds. 37,000, 7,000 today, just 5,500 psychiatric beds. By the way, 1959, we had less than 20 million people living in California. So half the population and multiple more beds and opportunities. Is it any wonder we're struggling, particularly with those who are self-medicated on the streets and sidewalks, those with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, paranoia. Those are the most vexing and challenging uh, among us. And that's why Prop 1 was so important. And Prop 1 was two things, and thank you, not all of you supported it by definition, it barely won. 22,000 votes. But while I'm so proud of it, it was bipartisan. Republicans supported it because we were forming an existing tax without increasing taxes, focusing again on driving accountability. One plan now required for all cities and counties as it relates to all their mental health funding. Real numerics in terms of goal setting, oversight, and audits of existing resources, prioritizing housing which was not even eligible under the old Mental Health Service Act reform, doing land use and zoning reforms in the initiative so we can drive time to development, to acquire and rehab cottage sites, scattered site sites, sites, not just new construction. And then we address the crisis that is housing. We need more housing. And we have that bond as a component. And here's the exciting part of it. Forgive the long windedness, but this is a tough issue. The exciting thing for me is few, about a decade ago, the state, again, sorry to keep bragging on Atkins, but she was a leader on this with Governor Brown, they did, they did a version of a bond on, on behavioral health. But with respect, it took two years after that passed, two years just to put out the notices for funding. And so you ask the question, when are we going to see? Well, I'm not going to oversee a two-year process just to put out notices for funding. So on Tuesday, we're going to announce a completely new strategy. We have broken down every damn box and paradigm of old thinking, and we're going to drive these reforms and accountability in a way we never have in this state in decades. I deeply appreciate the frustration you all had on this topic. So, uh, just know, we, we, share, we share this anxiety, and, and we share this energy, but I'm going to give up, and, and we, we're just breaking down all the barriers and rules, and I'll close one final thing. When I talk about accountability, we need it. Ask the folks in Huntington Beach. And I just ask the folks in Huntington Beach, look in the mirror. You want to be part of the solution, you want to be part of the problem. They are a poster child as a jurisdiction for what not to do. Affordability is the issue of our time in the state of California. In more ways, more days, that's the issue that defines so much of our stress. And affordability is not complicated. It's Econ 101, supply demand. We've got to build more housing. But you have communities that don't, not only don't even believe in that, refuse to even participate in a planning process. Some in their nose. 
and then complaining the whole time that California's too expensive. So we really, really have to address that issue, and that's why we are suing cities that does not make a governor popular.
Thank you. 